So as you know, I was at Coachella last weekend. Yes. Did you have a good time? I had an amazing time. We were guests of a band called Blur, a British band Blur, which you may remember. I don't. The song that they're most well known for, the one they've made the most money off of, is called Song Number Two. I'm sure you've heard it because it's been used in every sporting event ever anywhere. It's the one where they have the woohoo. It's woohoo. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Of That's course, them. of course. They were lovely. They were absolutely super gracious. And we were in the artist bus on the way over. Uh-huh. Our driver, one of those big Strider vans. Sprinter vans. He, sprinter vans. Sorry, Sprinter van. He just like has had it with doing the commute to and from Coachella. Oh, I can imagine. Right? It just is awful. So we're like in this long line of tour buses, whatever, artists and VIPs and all this shit. And he's like, yeah, fuck this. And just passes all of them in like the center turn lane. Oops. And just merges back in. And everyone on the bus was just like quiet. Like everyone just stopped talking. We're going to get killed now. At no point was it unsafe. It was just a ballsy maneuver, right? Oh no, when they start shooting at you, you're <laughs> going to get killed. I was sitting in the middle of the bus. I don't think Gwen Stefani has a gun. So like I was having a hard time hearing him up front because you know people are talking and everyone's got this like heavy british accent and it goes quiet when he yeah. does this yeah. he gets up the end he merges back in you know probably shaved yeah. 15 minutes 10 15 minutes off our time he says something that i kind of couldn't make out something like like you got to move or whatever and i said i'm sorry we can't hear you over the sound of your giant clanging balls <laughs> I was like, I don't know if this is going to fly or not in this group, but it got a laugh from everyone. And I was like, all sure. right, I'm good. I'm, I'm now officially the life of the party. Perfect. Basically, he's he's going to the long line of the supermarket, yes. throwing somebody out of the way yes. in front of the line and just butting his way in. But here's the thing. He actually wasn't. We were going to a different artist entrance. Everyone else was going straight into like the VIP section. Okay. We actually turned left. So we ended up slowing down no one. Quiet, please. I think that's why he ultimately did it. Yeah. But still, it was hard to tell because it would sound like two giant brass spheres <laughs> banging into one another. In four. While we were driving. Three. To it. Two. Presents a truly terrible podcast. Welcome to Nonsense Season 2, Episode 15. I'm Jeff Parker. I'm Tittle. This is our take on the week's business, tech, and entertainment headlines. This time, we'll look at drugs that don't work. Uh, those are the second least fun drugs in my book. It's World Amateur Radio Day. Amateur radio, commonly referred to as ham radio, makes use of the radio frequency spectrum for non-commercial purposes, such as exchanging messages, private recreation, emergency communication, wireless experimentation, and self-training. CJ, you've got a ham license. I know, and what's convenient about that is we are so uh, close to each other in the ham license licensing spectrum. KF6 EWA. I'm KF6 EWA and you are KF6 EVY and I am still grumpy that I have a fucking W in my call sign because you have to say W when you give your call sign. It's literally the hardest letter in the alphabet to say and I got the first one in that sequence, the WA. But the nice part is uh, what's W phonetically? Whiskey. I get to say whiskey. That's the only saving grace is that I can say whiskey, <laughs> which ironically, it's like the, the only letter that the phonetic explanation is easier to say than the fucking letter itself. Oh, for sure. For sure. You can say whiskey instead of W. How's your week going? I've had a lovely week. As I mentioned uh, earlier, I was was out at uh, Coachella in the desert, uh, which was which was awesome. Everybody there was great. Sure. You know, I've been going for years and I will say this was the absolute best weather we've ever had. It wasn't hot. It wasn't cold. Oh, wow. It was just lovely and perfect. I also had <laughs> I also had some of the best pudding I've ever had. I didn't, I didn't go to Coachella expecting to have good pudding yeah but there was this guy giving away samples and he took one look at me and was like you need some samples you need some pudding my friend and uh, i went over and tried it and it is it is damn good it's uh i think it's sykes desserts from from orange county lovely pudding yeah and the dude i think felt so bad for me that he actually gave me a whole <laughs> order of it for free that's so nice and then as I'm, I'm literally shoveling this i'm shoveling this into my mouth and then he goes uh will you record a social reel for us i'm like you want video of me just like eating like sure oh that's so fun and he was kind enough to put it on his uh on his instagram story it was really fun so anyway, it was it was a fun time. Ran into a bunch of uh, of A-listers there, as you would expect. But I did not cross paths with uh, Mr. Bezos or, or T-Swift. They were both there. Yeah, I think they knew I was there and they were keeping a low profile. Anyway, how about you? How was your week? We had a couple Dodger rain delays, which was actually so fun. Sure. Other cities have this all the time. And yeah. it's just an annoyance to them. For us, we were delayed for two hours and 15 minutes. And it was it was joyous it was so much fun because you see people who you see all the time but you never get a chance to sure. talk to and, sure you know it, it, it was great it was great dodger stadium has gone eight seasons without a rain delay that's fascinating yeah do they bring out little tarps and stuff and cover up all the dirt a big giant tarp covers the field it gets giant applause as they yeah. take the tarp off sure. the field uh-huh. and then they realize oh no the rain's starting again and and it gets booze as they bring the tarp back out They're on like the a... field this went back and forth several <laughs> really? times it was it They're was like, great. It's like a giant confused Roomba that just keeps bringing it back and putting it back and then bringing it back. It was absolutely delightful. This is one of my many, many problems with this 
quote sport, this activity that you call baseball. Yeah, yeah. Like, first of all, they can't play when the rain is out. What? Because they don't want to get dirty. I don't understand. Like a little drizzle, and they just stop everything. Well, if you step on that big base, which would be like you know sli- uh, being on a slip and slide, you you could break a leg. Little slippery. Oh. They play football in the snow and the rain and the hail and the sleet. There are no big bases that you can slide across. There are people though that you literally have to stomp upon, so it's a little bit different. They play hockey where you literally are sliding everywhere in the snow. Again, different because you're you're expecting uh, to slide. Just put skates on the fucking players. <laughs> They're wearing cleats. What, how are they going to slide around? How are you going to slide on a base with cleats? I don't understand. I feel like they should bring in some elements. The MLB should bring in some elements of banana ball. And like maybe you should get those, you know, those snowmakers they have like at, at Mountain yeah, yeah, High. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They should like have those. And like every time there's like, I don't know, you know, three balls, you can then shoot snow onto the first baseline. Uh, well, you and I are going to a Savannah banana game soon. I very we much want to go to a Savannah way bananas to, game. What, some way to get tickets. Those are always sold out. We got to find some way to get That go. looks like a baseball game I could really get into. That looks like a blast. All right, let's get to our headlines. Let's do it. Tesla reportedly halts Cybertruck deliveries as customers cite issue with accelerator pedal. This is what happened to those people who crashed into the Beverly Hills Hotel sign. Their accelerator got stuck. At the time, were they looking at the rust that was forming on the side panels, and is that what distracted they them? They could have been. That would have been distracting. Did the, did the accelerator rust itself down? Is that what happened? That's what happens is you step down in the accelerator <laughs> and it doesn't let up. It doesn't come back. This is like the casing for this thing. It's like, oh, okay. because of an inexpensive part that where they could have put in a probably a better sure. quality part. Sure. The, the quote was, this is a prime example of cheap engineering and the cost going, going too cheap and too simple. Something Tesla is known for. By the way, Lotus is also known for that. Let me tell you, yeah. Lotus in many places was like, why do what you can do with $1 when you can do it with 50 pence? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, guys, thanks. Yeah, this is fascinating. So they, they actually stopped delivering them, right? They stopped building them, trying to figure out what the issue is for like yeah. a week or two. They've totally stopped, stopped delivery. And so what's the fix? Just more glue? The cover may separate and get stuck behind the trim, which had potentially led to several accidents. We've seen this before. Right, I think it was like 2014. What was her name? Christina Balin. Oh yeah, she's still suing him. Yeah, she was like shit canned for ten years later. Yeah. She's still in court with them, trying to get them to admit. This is like the woman, like her her literal initials are, are engraved on the batteries of the yeah. the Model S's. Like she was instrumental, I think, in making these cars catch on fire. Whatever the fuck they do, <laughs> is, that, is that the goal? Um, Maybe not quite. But uh, yeah, I'm guessing she was onto something. If they are now accelerating wildly, it was the same sort of thing. It was like carpet or something behind the pedal that would cause the pedal to get stuck, and she, she and no one would respond to her. Literally all they had to do is tell people, take the carpets out of the car. The carpets is sure. gonna, are going to curl up and cause a problem. And they wouldn't do it. And eventually she went to Elon Musk and thought, well, sure. Elon Musk wants what's good for of Tesla. Course. And and of course, he proceeded then to have her fired. What she didn't realize though, was that Elon's cousin, Carl Musk, is the carpet provider. Makes the carpet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carl it's, it's going to be something. A lot of shag. While we're doing our Elon Musk Tesla block. Oh boy, is there more? Tesla's putting Elon Musk's pay package up for another vote after a judge voided the first one. Uh, this is interesting to me. So this is for what? For the shareholders, right? A shareholder vote, yeah. Now, does he get the vote? Because if he gets the vote, he's 40% of the way there. He's a shareholder. I would imagine he does. He owns like 20% of the business, right? So he's got 40% of his way to 50% total. So he's almost halfway to the halfway point. He wanted something like $48 million for his work this year. What? Was no. that the number? No. no. He wanted something like $48 billion yes. for his work this year. I think you're off. I think they would be happy to give him $48 million for his work <laughs> this year. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry, did you want a free car or did you want a, you know, a venti latte? What is it exactly you're looking for here? The goal is he has to hit a market valuation of $600. $150 billion. By the way, this is the dumbest thing in the world. You never want to peg someone's compensation based on the market valuation. Well, if you're a bunch of shareholders looking to dump the shit out of it, then sure, that doesn't seem like a bad deal. Right, which is no way to run a company. What you want to peg the valuation to is what are you making in earnings? Sure. Well, how much have earnings. you increased earnings? That's All what right. we care about. Okay, this is the Buffett show. Earnings. How cute. <laughs> earnings how, matter. How quaint. Earnings. No, 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 sir. Just revenue, EBITDA, that you can hide a bunch of things behind the line, and then profit. So that's what uh, he wants. He he wants a, you know, he wants a big giant uh, pay package. That's but what I think that, so post judge dismissal, right? I think this has gone from like fifty six billion dollars down to forty seven. Yeah, so he's taking a nine billion dollar haircut. It's all theoretical until someone actually approves. Uh, it. Yeah, but I think that's what he's asking for. Yeah, the point is he's got like twelve thousand kids, so like it's going to be hard. Like some of them are going to have to be homeschooled now. He's <laughs> giving up nine billion dollars because he's taking so much of a cut. Sure, I don't know how many. I don't know. He's fathered ha- half the planet. I don't even know anymore. So, but what, what I think is fascinating about this this original pay package from what I think it was twenty. 2018, as you were saying, they pegged it to a valuation. Amazingly, and, and much to my disbelief, they managed to exceed that valuation, right? They managed to, to clip that, which I don't know what kind of magic he used to do that, but it seems like, uh, at least based on them approving this, that the business is doing really well. Tesla to lay off more than 10% of its workers as sales slow. <laughs> Maybe That's not. our next headline. Is that how they're paying for it? Times are getting tough for Tesla. The electric oh, no. vehicle automaker had been riding high with quarter after quarter profits of successive growth.
growth and plenty of profits in the process, but lately the success has mostly been due to a series of price cuts meant to tempt customers yeah. into buying the aging lineup. I hope in this 10% they lay off the guy that wasn't putting the bolts in the steering columns. I think that's the first guy that maybe they should have. That's why they're uh, doing this. They're like, yeah. the other 9.9% of you are just collateral damage. It's the only way you get rid of this guy. He's been here for 20 years. Well, they're going to keep him because he was saving him money by not putting that's steering column bolts into point. all of the cars. Well, no, he was still taking the bolts. He just didn't install them. Oh. It wasn't actually saving money. He was selling them on eBay because guess what you need <laughs> when your steering wheel comes off? You need a fucking bolt. You sell them for 100 bucks each. You can get a lot for them, yeah. It's a good side business. Absolutely, absolutely positively need them. This is not a, a great look, I guess. Well, but he's going to make up for it because uh, free speech on X is over. He's now uh, making users pay to post. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay. First of all, this is a terrible idea. Are they going to apply the same thing to Tesla? Like, if you want to make a left-hand turn, you have to pay a dollar. Exactly. Every left-hand turn is a dollar. Left turns as a service. Right-hand turn. <laughs> <laughs> R-H-A-S, free. L-H-A-S, a dollar per turn. Left hand is a service. That's comedy. I have to believe this is going to be like one of the final nails in the coffin of this thing. If you pay gate posting, okay, so you can read the shit people are willing to pay for free? And this is under the context of trying to get rid of the bots? How many bots do you actually think get eradicated on a one dollar? Zero. Well, unless what it gets you is tie back to who it is, because there might not be enough payment providers. That could be interesting. Yeah. If you see one person's credit card being used on 200 accounts, you know something's up. Yeah. That could be interesting. Justice Department to file antitrust suit against Live Nation. Oh, wow. U.S. Justice Department is preparing to sue Live Nation for antitrust violations as soon as next month, according to a report in the Wall Street Journal, a move that could change the shape of the multi-billion dollar company that is the world's largest live ticket entertainment organization and owns Ticketmaster. North America's biggest ticket vendor. It's pretty much impossible to hold an event that isn't yeah. ticketed by Ticketmaster. Ask Pearl Jam how that worked out for them. Yeah. Remember when Pearl Jam had their, their fight with Ticketmaster and they basically said, we're not going to book any Ticketmaster venues? Yeah, sure. That was basically the impetus for Coachella yeah. because Pearl Jam did a concert in 93 at the Empire Polo Club out in Palm Springs. Mm-hmm. And that was the first time they had used it as a concert venue and it sort of proved that it could host a venue. That a zillion people would come out? Yeah, the founder of Coachella to ultimately host an event there in 99. 99 was the first Coachella. It's a fascinating story, but it's Roots really go back to that Ticketmaster Pearl Jam fight. Pearl Jam, yeah, a sort of lawsuit slash fight. Uh, I just thought that was fascinating. Now, by the way, Coachella, do you know how many acres Coachella is? Wow, no idea. The Empire Polo Club has got to be a thousand acres. Counting the, the the event and all the supporting assets? Absolutely no idea. 650 acres. Wow. That is madness. And you have like, to walk through all of it and it's all dust. You have to, you, they literally have those little switchback turnstiles in all 650 acres. You just that's keep the, that's Moses, all the literally. acreage. Is- Halfway through, <laughs> Moses was just sitting down on an apple cart. He was so fucking tired. He's like, I haven't walked this far in years. <laughs> I had Moses on my bingo card for this episode, so I had to work him in somewhere. Thank you. Well, you Thank and you. I, I certainly, I, I don't think we see eye to eye on the Apple and Google store sort of lawsuits that have been, been playing out and we've talked about here. Pretty sure you and I see eye to eye on the Ticketmaster monopoly antitrust lawsuit. It's pretty clear it's a monopoly. I mean, it's impossible. I mean, this to... is another great example where if they just didn't charge insane fees, nobody would care. This lawsuit threatens who they are and the principles that set them apart in fiercely competitive markets. But they do charge insane fees so you do care if i want to go pick up my tickets in advance if i want to have them mailed to me there's a mail to me fee if i want to go pick them up in person there's a pick them up in person fee there's a use your ticket fee of course you buy your ticket like you want to use it oh no that's different that's a different category if you want to just display them anyone else should be able to issue tickets it's a qr code yeah yeah i get it but they've got all the venues locked up so well they've got all they've got all the venues in their hand they've got all the acts in their hands too right like you get one you get the other this is nuts this i don't know how this ends but i feel like something here should change government can change this because this it's clearly a monopoly and it's clearly you know silly unfair iPhone sales are plunging. Here's why. Apple smartphone sales tumbled, a stunning 10% last quarter. According to market research firm IDC, the main cause, iPhone sales in China fell sharply. I thought it was just that the iPhone customers really enjoyed the monopoly and they were disappointed now that it's getting broken up. There's no way they're going to break up Apple. It's not going to happen. This year, we're expecting Android to grow at twice the pace of iOS. That's kind of nuts, says Nabila Propi, the research director at at IDC. That's kind of nuts. IDC usually doesn't have a horse in this race, so they're usually pretty even keel about their projections. I think. Global smartphone shipments increased 7.8% year over year. Wow. That's a lot. From what to what? That's a lot of phones. It's like 300 million phones. Yeah, right? 289 million devices in the first quarter of 2024. That's kind of bonkers to me. So that's like, what is that, roughly 8% of the world? Aren't we out of people who don't have smartphones? Exactly. How, how are there still people who don't have smartphones? I mean, I guess maybe that's an upgrade cycle. Like, let's assume let's assume half of the planet has a smartphone. I'm sure it's past that, but, you know, kids and stuff. So that's 4 billion people. Mm-hmm. 300 million of the 4 billion is roughly, what, 8%? Yeah. So I guess if you're upgrading every 5 
five years ish, you're probably in that window. Maybe I don't know. That seems like a lot. I upgrade a lot more than that. I and I and I'm a slow upgrader. Well, yeah, that's why you get an iPhone. You keep that thing for years. They just keep supporting it. Mine's like ten years old. <laughs> Do they really? Nope. My phone they're supporting now for seven years. I'm never going to keep this thing seven years. Isn't that uh, isn't that required? Isn't that like a EU California is it California? California law? Yeah. Samsung had been the top smartphone manufacturer for the past 12 years. Apple took the crown last year, but only for one quarter. Samsung took the top spot back in the first quarter of 2024. I didn't realize that Samsung has basically owned this for the past decade plus. They've owned it ever since Huawei was, uh, you know, got the ire of the U.S. government and like got pushed out of the got, U.S. Got squished. Yeah. Huawei was making great phones, by the way. I had one. The original Google phone yeah. was manufactured by Huawei, and it was one of my favorite phones. It was great. You don't have one anymore, though, right? You know, I probably have it in a drawer somewhere, but I haven't turned it on. Well, I mean, you're... I mean, your active phone is not your active phone is is not a Huawei phone anymore. No, it's a Google Pixel 8 Pro. I would assume that's made at Foxconn. Now that you're off the Huawei phone, do you still take all your data and send it to the CCP, or what do you? And they just uh, come to the it? house and get it. <laughs> they just show up. It's really nice. It's, <laughs> it's a convenience. It's like a little. It's like when they pass around the the little donation basket. You just put all of your data in. Put all your data all right your, in. Why would the CCP out? want any of my data? The CCP doesn't care one bit about me. I disagree, sir. Have you noticed that there's been a big increase in features on air fryers? <laughs> I like that. That's because of you, sir. Okay, enough with the headlines. Up next, we're going to talk about drugs. It's acetaminophen all the way down. Ooh, that's going to make me sneeze. <laughs> You're taking acetaminophen wrong, my friend. Let me tell you. How do you feel about your drugs? What kind of drugs? Just like your general drugs. Like, do you want them to be safe? Do you want them to be effective? Do you want them to be both? You know, I prefer not to use them. Sure, of course. I have medications I'm supposed to take because I'm a certain age now. Yeah, sure. And I have a pill container that tells me Monday through Friday through whatever, whatever, however the week goes. <laughs> Hopefully <forgot>. Sunday. <laughs> Um, if not, we may have to talk about your container. And there's sure. an AM slot and a PM oh, slot. Oh, wow. Now. You're at that level oh, now. There's yeah. an AM and a PM yeah. slot. Wow. Oh. That's sad. So, no, I'm not necessarily fond of my drugs, but, I, but I'm but i mostly a good person and I take them. Is it like one of those automatic like cat feeders where you just have to stand there and look at it? And then at Pretty 2 close. p.m. it just dispenses. <laughs> and they just come and just Pretty gobble close. them up. It's like, ah, ah, blue ones, purple ones, red ones, take them all. It'd be super exciting. I am with you on this. I also do not like to take uh, really any over-the-counter prescription meds. I, I'd prefer to not have them. This is like statins and things like that, which, by the way, are like miracle drugs. If you look sure. at the reduction in heart attacks yeah. since statins have become popular, it's really amazing, it's amazing. What, what's happening. Yeah, it's weird. The, the science seems to work. It does have a tendency a to work. A whole group of people that don't believe in it, but, uh, but for the most part, it does generally seem to work. It's really strange. We've only been at it for about really 150. 50 years or so. Drugs, yes. Yeah. Science, science, no. Yeah. Science a lot longer no, no, no. than that. Medical I science. I don't know what version of what book you're reading that says science started in the <laughs> 1850s, but it's been going around a little longer than that. I think uh, my good friend Galileo may want to have words with you. Uh, okay, so I, I came across this, this uh, excellent article in Scientific American about the efficacy of drugs. Uh, specifically uh, decongestants, right? Decongestants in particular. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and, and there's this really, I, I thought, kind of interesting story. That Not my share. favorite thing to take. Well, yes and no. I mean, when you need them, you need them. That has been my yeah. experience, right? Like being being congested, I think, is somewhat somewhat miserable. For the longest time, the the sort of leader in this space has been uh, pseudoephedrine, which is basically what you and I would, would know as Sudafed, okay. which you used to be able to buy over the counter, just waddle into a, you know, a Rite Aid or a, a Walgreens or whatever, yeah. and you could just buy Sudafed and that was it. You didn't need a script. You didn't need to talk to anybody. It was very simple. When they make meth, this is what they use, right? Yeah. So it's a precursor to uh, meth manufacturing, which, uh, by the way, I will say after doing the research for this show, I'm pretty sure I'm on even a couple more now state lists and federal lists. <laughs> <laughs> just for just for looking up those yeah, words. Yeah, like like pseudo like pseudo pseudo ephedrine colon how to make meth. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh yeah, yeah sure. okay, this is how this works. They make it in coffee pots in, in hotels. The coffee pots always have traces of meth production in them. Really? Where where did that come from? Is it not true? I don't know. I Everybody don't know. always says don't use the <laughs> coffee pots. People make meth out of them. Well, fuck that. I'm gonna start making coffee pots in every hotel I go to. <laughs> Why not? You get a little extra bump in the morning. That sounds like a freebie right there. You also lose your teeth. <laughs> well, you know, look, everything's a trade-off in life. Maybe that's why the people that stay at the hospital Holiday Inn are so amped up the next day to answer questions. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. You're like, I stayed in the Holiday Inn last night. It's like, no, you just had meth coffee. It was the meth coffee. In 2005, federal law compelled retailers nationwide to move pseudoephedrine, aka Sudafed, from yeah. over the counter to behind the counter, which is interesting to note that behind the counter is truly the original BTC. So <laughs> fuck Bitcoin. 
It's not really called BTC. <laughs> I call it BTC, but it is technically behind the counter. I'm just, I have this amazing ability to take the first letter of each word in a series <laughs> and put them together. And then I think it's funny that it's BTC also is Bitcoin. Something, something my translator gave money to my, my bookie. So, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. So in 2005, they, they pushed uh, Sudafed, right? This, this pseudoephedrine, which is what I'll call it for the rest of the, of, of the segment, uh, behind the counter. And this was in an effort to combat its use in making illicit methamphetamines. There you go. Pseudoephedrine is a precursor to making uh, methamphetamines. So that kind of, it didn't go away, but now it got more restricted. So if you've tried to buy Sudafed in the past, you know, 20 years, you've experienced this effect. Restrictions vary by state, but usually the restriction is around no more than 3.6 grams per day and no more than nine grams purchased in any 30 day period. From a single store. Well, this is, this is where there's some gray area because it's tracked on a per store basis. Most stores, most chains have unified their stores. I don't know if the stores talk to each other. I think some do, some don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's only so many chains. How many of these could you replicate? The point is they're writing down your name and address. And if you're buying enough to start making drugs out of it, to start making meth out of it, they've Theoretically, got a, a they can track you. In theory. Yeah. This is still kind of shitty for the average American because if you get sick, you're not even really getting enough for a 30-day supply. But imagine if you're a parent with sure. three or four or five kids. Now what? You have much bigger problems than Sudafed, but yes. <laughs> good, good point. Good. You make a very <laughs> valid point here thinking this one through. So I feel like everyone's been been sort of affected by this. And this switch from, from uh, OTC to, to BTC prompted manufacturers to change the formulations of cough and cold medicines in the U.S. So there's this whole new, it's not really new, but new to us as consumers category of cold and cough medicines that are now OTC. Okay. That's what's called phenylephrine. So you've had this sort of rise of phenylephrine since the mid 2000s. And, uh, and, and it was because pseudoephedrine was, was pushed behind the counter. Gotcha. Phenylephrine was the only remaining oral decongestant sold on the shelves of you know pharmacies, grocery stores, convenience stores, whatever. Like, that was the only thing you could buy without having to go talk to a pharmacist or, or get tracked in this book. Makers of oral decongestants and cold remedies reformulated all their products to contain phenylephrine, and they sold these under a different name. So you'd see, like, instead of Sudafed, this is Sudafed PE. Phenylephrine. So it sort of looks like Sudafed, but it's Sudafed PE. Yeah. Now you went from, like, just a couple phenylephrine products to now all of them. Like, you know, everything that's OTC is effectively phenylephrine. Does it do the same thing? Is the effect the same? And that's the show, everybody. What have you seen this week? <laughs> have you seen anything interesting? As my as my astute co-host has pointed out, there might be some problems with the efficacy of phenylephrine. Customers did not realize that these products had been reformulated. And this is super interesting to me. Most people don't really know, especially back then, that Sudafed and Sudafed PE were significantly different. I certainly didn't know because I just, I get sick, I go in, I buy Sudafed, sure. I feel better. But consumers started complaining to their pharmacists when Sudafed PE did not work like the, quote, old Sudafed. Mm -hmm. Those pharmacists then contacted the author of this article that I read, uh, his name's Randy Hatton, at the University of Florida's Drug Information and Pharmacy Resource Center. So it's a laboratory that, among other things, teaches doctor of pharmacy students how to receive, research, and answer drug-related questions. Excellent. The calling pharmacist asked, you know, some pretty <laughs> simple and obvious questions. One, does oral phen phenylephrine work? And then if so, what's the correct dose? Because their patients are complaining that the shit's not working. Sure. Right? So he's like, what do we do? Before we, we dig into answering these questions, I think it's worth talking a little bit about the, the FDA process. So if you're if you're in bed and you're you're ready to take a nap, now's a good time to just roll over on your pillow because I'm pretty <laughs> sure in the FDA process, you're going to veer off the road and, and fall asleep. So the FDA has multiple regulatory processes for different types of uh, medicinal compounds. Most people I would suspect are familiar with the new drug application process, which requires clinical trials for prescription drug approvals, right? So when you hear We're about- We're vaguely familiar with it. Yeah, yes. but like, you know, like there's a, you know, a drug that's got to go on trial and they do yeah. tests and they do it against the placebo, yada, yada, yada. But many OTCs or non-prescription drugs are regulated very differently. In fact, the categories of prescription and non-prescription drugs were created in 1951 as part of the Durham-Humphrey Amendment to the 1938 Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Okay. And then it wasn't until 1962, so 11 years later, that that act was amended so that drugs had to be proved not only safe, but also uh, effective. Hence the requirement for well-done clinical trials. So before that, you could just prove that they existed? You didn't have to prove that they worked? You, you got to go back to 1938 to when drugs had to be safe, which sounds kind of obvious now, right? A drug, you know, has to be safe. But think about like the snake oil salesman back in the day. Oh, sure, right? sure, sure. So in 1938, the government, the U.S. government said, okay, look, you, you at least got to make sure your shit's safe. We're not killing people with your drugs. 13 years later, they established this prescription and non-prescription drug classifications. And then it wasn't until 11 years after that, they required the drugs to be safe and effective, wow. which is really interesting. So it's like you could have a safe drug that didn't do anything, but not be effective. Yeah. And that's really the gist of this whole story I'm telling here is talking about the efficacy 
for drugs that were sort of pre-1962. And that's this this um, sort of loophole that Randy Hatton had identified. For prescription drugs, the FDA tried to address pre-1962 approvals through a review of more than 3,000 substances. Okay. And most of those drugs have now been reviewed and addressed, but there are still some unapproved prescription medications on the market today, such as like a extended release form of oral nitroglycerin that is used to treat chest pain mm-hmm. and, and other conditions. Mm-hmm. So some things still have not been reviewed, but for the most part, I think they've gotten through most of those. For non-prescription drugs, 10 years after the 1960 to amendment to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, the FDA established the OTC monograph process, which required products that hadn't been proven effective to be reconsidered. And the way they did this, the FDA formed advisory panels grouping hundreds of ingredients into 26 categories based on the product's uses. After gathering all available information, both published and unpublished, from manufacturers, the advisory panels issued final reports to the FDA about whether these ingredients were considered, quote, generally recognized as safe and effective. So this is uh, usually abbreviated G-R-A-S-E. Mm-hmm. I don't think they pronounce it grass, but it looks like grass to me. So they put these into one of three categories. It would either be grass, not grass, or inconclusive. Sounds like you're talking about an entirely different kind of drug when you say grass. Oh, of course. Of course. I, uh, I, which by the way, grass is also grass, but we'll save that fight for another day, okay. I presume. I mean, it's definitely effective. I don't know if it's safe. I think it's safe. <laughs> it's grass adjacent. How's that? Okay. We'll say grass is grass adjacent. There's going to be a whole bunch of kids that listen to this show I found out recently, which I think is not a great idea. So now they have to ask mommy and daddy what, what grass means. And please understand and neither of us are doctors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, <laughs> worth pointing out. The way the FDA has approached these these pre-1962 drugs is to say that you know uh, these grass ingredients can be used in non-prescriptive drugs without the FDA's approval if the use matches the one presented in the ingredients monograph. Okay. So to me, I'm not a pharmacist. To my non-pharmacist eyes, this seems like a reasonable approach, right? They've taken a bunch of drugs that are known to do these things and said that if you use these drugs in these these um, you know quantities to treat these conditions, it's okay. Go ahead, manufacturers make your products. Make sense? If, if they work. Well, how dare you, sir, jump ahead in my I, notes. I couldn't jump ahead in your notes. These words, I couldn't, I couldn't read these words like if German, I had it? to. It's just a it lot totally of, does. It's just a lot of consonants with the occasional vowel just sprinkled throughout. You know, it amazes me because as you and I, I'm sure our, our um, consistent listeners have figured out, I live with a pharmacist and she will just throw yeah. around these multi-syllabic words like I should know them. I'm like, what the fuck did you just say? So let's talk about the monograph for the OTC nasal decongestion specifically, which is which is what this this article I read was focused on. It was started in 1976 and listed three oral drugs, phenyl propanolamine, pseudofedrin, and phenylephrine. The review took 18 years, and the final monograph was released in 1994. Okay. So for nasal decongestions, they had three drugs as the point of this. Phenyl propanolamine, you may remember as like Accutrim or Dexatrim. It was called Megatrim and Westrim, other brand names. I'm hearing the word trim at the end of all of them. So it was a decongestion that constricted your blood vessels, which is what most decongestions do. But it had this added bonus of also acting as an appetite suppressant. <laughs> so bonus. So now you are you can breathe and you're getting thinner. It's a little wig ovi. But it carried this annoying little side effect of increased risk of hemorrhagic stroke. Oh, so ooh. bleeding into the brain or into tissue surrounding the brain. That's a problem. That's a bit of a problem. It was removed from the market in the early 2000s because of its association with these strokes. It was effective. It just was not safe. Sure. Now you're down from three drugs to two drugs. But then, as I mentioned at the top, the CMEA, which is the Combat Methamphetamines Epidemic Act, pushed pseudofedrin behind the counter in 2005. Right. So not prescription, but just behind the counter and harder to find. So now by the mid 2000s, the only drug on the FDA's nasal decongestant monograph was phenylephrine. It was the only one left that you could get OTC. So now in the mid 2000s, this is when this uh, Randy Hatton from the University of Florida's uh, Drug Information and Pharmacy Resource Center, by the way, his articles where I'm ripping all of this from, he set out to prove that that pseudofedrin's replacement, this oral phenylephrine, was ineffective as a decongestant. He and his students searched the literature and located an article by Leslie Hendelez, published in 1993. Uh, he was reporting on well done but unpublished studies conducted by um, uh, Highland Bickerman of Columbia University before 1971. Okay. Bickerman's research showed that phenyl propanolamine, the the oral decongestant at the time, the one that, you know, gives you strokes, worked, as did pseudoephedrine. But oral phenylephrine did not. So of these three drugs on the OTC's monograph, two worked, one of those two wasn't safe, the third one did not work. Yeah. But his, his paper didn't get much attention because phenylephrine wasn't widely used in the 1990s, right? Everything was everything was um, uh, the pseudofedrin. Yeah. Now, 10 years later, that work is suddenly super important. Randy Hatton contacted Hendelez, who is uh, now a professor of emeritus at the University of Florida, and they decided to get to the bottom of this oral phenylephrine efficacy issue. So this is, again, we're still looking in the mid-2000s, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So after the FDA moved to require that drugs be shown to work, it evaluated the efficacy of these OTC drugs already on the market by having the expert 
panel review the existing data on them, right? That's that's where these OTC monographs came from. So the monograph panel for oral decongestants reviewed a few published studies and multiple unpublished studies for phenylephrine. Of the unpublished studies, only four showed oral uh, phenylephrine was effective, and seven showed it was no better than a placebo. Mm. So Hatton obtained copies of all the evidence used by the nasal decongestant review panel via a Freedom of Information Act request and performed a systematic review and meta-analysis of that data. Mm -hmm. So he basically said, okay, give me the sources that you guys used on the monograph. I want to look at it because I don't think this shit works. Right. Their findings validated the concerns raised by Bickerman, uh, that Bickerman study in 1993, uh, and the pharmacist calls that had been, been coming to the University of Florida. Interestingly, they found that one commercial lab gave strikingly positive results for oral phenylephrine's efficacy. Then this is great, right? Like you already know where this is going. Of course. Right? There's one study that looks great. Like this shit is amazing. So he looks at the data and the low variability of the data, a sort of a lack of increasing effect with, with increased dose and the lack of a placebo response prompted them to look at the report more closely. Sure. A statistical analysis of the lab's data suggested integrity issues. What they noticed was that measurements of variables are, are you know typically expected to show a uniform distribution from zero to nine for the last digit. Right. Because you would expect that. You'd expect there to be an even distribution. But in this example, nearly a quarter of all measurements ended with a five. How many ways can you spell fraud? <laughs> right. And he's like, well, these anomalies are, these happen only when data is falsified, right? Like, Of course. They were confident at that point that the oral phenylephrine did not work. He's like, all right, the one study you have that shows positive results was, was falsified, right? So this shit does not work. So then he's like, okay, what's the next step? Let's just contact the FDA and explain what we had found. And he he described this in his article as being uh, naive, right? He's like, I naively contacted the FDA to explain what we had found. And he's like, the agency was not interested. Oral phenylephrine was not harming anyone, so it saw no need to limit the sales, right? It is safe. Wait, 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 wait. What happened exactly. to efficacy? I thought we had exactly. both mandates. Now, you know, trying to be realistic on this, or I should say trying to be pragmatic on this, the FDA takes a risk-based approach to regulatory actions because it has limited resources, right? And the relative safety of oral Oral phenylephrine relegated the drug to the back burner despite its uh, ineffectiveness, which I understand. You're selling snake oil then. But exactly, you're back to selling snake oil. Randy decided to go the political route, contacting then Representative uh, Henry Waxman of California, whose committee at the time had FDA oversight. Cool. Waxman's office wrote four letters imploring the agency to reconsider oral phenylephrine's effectiveness to just nothing, right? Nothing happened. Mm -hmm. They also submitted a citizen's petition to the FDA in early 2007. Finally, in December 2007, more than a year after Hatton first discovered that oral uh, phenylephrine didn't work, the FDA somewhat begrudgingly convened a non-prescription drugs advisory committee meeting to review the compound's effectiveness. Right. Again, going back to this this sort of time in nasal decongestant history, most OTCs had either contained uh, phenylpropanolamine or pseudofedrin. Few had contained this oral phenylephrine, and you you presume that's because manufacturers privately questioned its efficacy. And the FDA's charge for that 2007 non-prescription drug advisory committee was to determine whether phenylephrine in a 10 milligram immediate release oral formulation sure. can be effective when dosed every four hours for symptomatic relief of nasal decongestion, right? That's like what they were selling this for. Right. Although most of the committee members voted that there was some evidence of efficacy, they recognized the limitations of the available evidence. They asked for new data on the absorption and efficacy of oral phenylephrine obtained using more modern standards. They basically said, look, look let's go get more data on this and try to figure it out. Yeah, sure. Now, sure. it's interesting. At the time, Shearing Plow, the maker of uh, Claritin D, which is like an allergy medication that contains loratadine and pseudofedrin, was already studying phenylephrine as an alternative oral decongestion. They want to not be behind the counter. Yeah, exactly. The company funded research uh, on this subject, including two studies that found phenylephrine was no better than a placebo in patients with seasonal allergies who were exposed to allergens, right? Grass and ragweed wow. in a controlled chamber. Yeah, yeah. Now, this immediately begged the question in my mind, what do you think that gig pays? Right, like you got allergies to grass and, and ragweed, <laughs> and then like we're gonna put you in this closed room and blast you with the shit that, that you know, just see what happens, right? How do you like, feel now, <laughs> CJ? It's like, man, you think about what goes into this this drug development. It's like, oh, that's pretty shitty. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. <laughs> just uh, five more minutes, Mr. Parker. Just five more minutes, you'll be fine. Okay, so here's the thing: the oral absorption of phenylephrine is erratic. Perhaps that's why it wasn't used as an oral decongestion until it was the only choice in front of the counter. Yeah, it had long been known that the enzymes in the lining of the gut metabolize oral phenylephrine into inactive metabolites, reducing the amount of the active compound that can enter the bloodstream. Wow. If it doesn't get into your bloodstream, guess what? It doesn't work. Right. So the most cited study on this topic found that an oral dose of phenylephrine had an absorption rate of 38%, but the researchers measured more than just the compound's active form. 
Later studies with more sensitive tests found that less than 1% of oral phenylephrine entered the bloodstream in an active form. That's not good. That's not a good look, right? Is there another way to get it into your bloodstream? Can it, can it be injected or is some way that bypasses this, well, this stomach yeah, destroying it? Yeah, but you can't do injections OTC, right? That's, yeah, okay. that's challenging. Maybe like a nasal spray or something like that, but I don't know. That's a whole nother. Yeah. Like now you're into pharmaceuticals that are well beyond my pay grade. Sure, sure. Although given my relationship and close proximity to the pharmacology industry, I'm sure there are going to be a whole bunch of people listening to this that will be sending me really nasty notes about mispronunciations and things that I got <laughs> sure. wrong. So, you know, bring it. What's interesting, though, is I talked to my, my, my wife initially had suggested this topic for this segment, and I talked to her about it. What's in, you know, she is knee deep in oncology prescription drugs. She doesn't right, know right, anything sure. about OTCs. Like it is a completely different world with the FDA than than um, uh, prescription drugs, specifically the oncology stuff she works on. Phenylephrine causes blood vessels to constrict, but if you can't get enough of it into your bloodstream, it just it's not going to do anything. Does right? nothing, like, right? So sure. there's no point. After that 2007 uh, FDA advisory committee suggested better data, and you had this uh, Shering Plow study, right? That I think it was Eli Meltzer of the Allergy and Asthma Medical Group and Research Center in San Diego. After that study, that showed that you know patients that received up to four times the approved dose still had no better response than placebo. Oh wow! Right? So just wow. you could just up the dosage; it just wasn't working. You get from one percent to four yeah. percent, like that's not enough. You know, if the goal is to constrict your blood vessels doesn't caffeine do that it does but i don't think as much oh but i don't know not enough that's a good question i'm totally like a doctor just take take my advice Uh, absolutely the things i know i cannot suggest anything better than that (laughs) some nice caffeine anytime you're just really feeling stuffed up have a nice glass of caffeine so in light of melcher's research hatton filed a second citizen's petition in 2015 with the fda his premise was that the science is clear oral phenylephrine does not work yeah and then he waited and he waited and nothing seemed to happen to the fda what's wrong with these people so here's what's interesting he wrote an academic commentary in 2022 asking why is oral phenylephrine on the market after compelling evidence of its ineffectiveness sure as a decongestion right it's not like vast numbers of people don't take this drug but it's but, not like this doesn't affect a very large number of people sure but you're not hurting them and i gotta believe and you know i think this is interesting you have to assume the fda has limited resources i think the fda generally speaking is doing a great job right we have it's very well trusted you can go buy a drug otc or prescription and assume it's not going to kill you by and large yes but i want to also assume it's got some effective that's where it's interesting like who like who are you really hurting well you're hurting me because i'm spending money on exactly. something that doesn't right? work you're spending an extra 50 100 200 bucks a year on drugs that just have no effect i look at that and i go well you also have a lot of of lost time here as well because had you just gone to you know waddled over to the pharmacist counter and gotten the right the behind right. the counter drug you would have been feeling better because you pretended it worked because you pretended i it took worked. something exactly. that didn't work so what had didn't know was at this time like 2022 that a new administration and the new fda commissioner had already started a thorough review of all available data so in 2023 16 external experts on the second non-prescription drug advisory committee looked at all the evidence compiled by the fda staff heard manufacturers arguments in favor of oral phenylephrine's efficacy and heard from experts like Hatton himself who argued that oral phenylephrine is ineffective. Yeah. And in the end, they concluded that oral phenylephrine is not grass, right? It is not okay. generally recognized as safe and, effect- uh, safe and uh, effective. A final ruling on whether decongestants containing the drug can still be sold will take time, but uh, Hatton, along with myself, are hopeful that science will prevail here. Oh, and as several million customers every month. Totally. We all hope science prevail. Just on this show, we're going to get to millions of customers that should not buy Sudafed PE because it doesn't work. Right. Take the time, get the stuff that's behind the counter. That's what, that's the bottom Because it actually, well, yeah, take them to the stuff that works. The stuff up front does not work. Yeah. Hadn't ended his article saying that from his experience, he's learned that the monograph process for OTC drugs approved before 1962 needs to be reexamined, right? Some sort of system, systematic review of the available evidence indicates that other non-prescription drugs, such as uh, guafensin, which is like a mucinex and robitussin, dextromethorphine, which is robitussin DM, and antihistamines marketed for colds, uh, probably don't help with coughs and colds. Yeah. So there's this other whole class of drugs that probably just don't do anything. Their use isn't dangerous, but their effects are likely to be the result of a placebo response, which is what you're seeing. Do you know what I find works for me for coughs and colds? Caffeine? No, I was going to say it wasn't caffeine, but for me, it's like if I just take a nap, if I take, if I get extra sleep, yeah. that seems to help. The body is pretty incredible at healing this stuff, but as it turns out, you know, these viruses we don't have a lot of uh, real solution for. Yeah. Anyway, the outcome for all of 
phenylephrine shows that the FDA needs more funding to look at these old drugs. Public funds need to be made available to support independent researchers who want to examine these products objectively. And this is the point that that Hutton made that I thought was fantastic. He said the government should be able to spend millions of dollars to save consumers billions on ineffective products. Yeah. Like that is a good trade-off, right? Companies that market these products have no incentive to prove they don't work because why would they? They just sell them, right? Not hurting anybody. Once it's considered safe and effective, that people aren't going to change. That's probably going to stay. What is going to change is the market. So there could be something on the market that's more efficacious, right? And you could see something and you would, you would hope that a free market would turn that over itself, right? You would hope that a free market would say, well, this drug's more effective. You advertise it and away you go. I don't think so because advertising is so powerful that you can get people to continue to buy snake oil. That's what's super interesting, right? Is on the OTCs, to my knowledge, there are no restrictions on, on advertising. You can advertise those till the cows come home. Whereas on prescription drugs, you do have restrictions on what you can and can't advertise. Yeah. So I got to believe for these manufacturers, these are giant cash cows. Of course, of course. Listener, if you're concerned at all about the confusion around these drugs, remember that pharmacists receive considerable education on OTC drugs and have to every year. So more than any other healthcare professional, more than your doctor, more than your, you know, your internist, pharmacists know a lot about these. And if they you, are up to speed, they are up to speed. And if you ask your pharmacist when yeah. you have questions about which OTC products to, to choose, they will help guide you. And then based on that, talk to your local congressional representative to support modern scientific reviews of old OTC products, because there is this big gap. And like I talked to my wife about this, and there are a handful of drugs that probably should not be on the market, like acetaminophen. Tylenol is terrible for you. In low doses, it's safe. But if you start abusing it or just taking it even within- Destroy your liver. Destroys your liver, right? And you look at like, and I didn't know this till she told me, cough medicine has been pulled off the market for kids. And it's not that it's not safe. It's that parents were overdosing their kids and killing them. Aye, aye, aye. So you can't even really get cough syrup for your kids. And what's interesting is where she thinks a lot of this came from is because they would suggest like, you know, whatever, a kid under- five years old, one tablespoon. And people wouldn't measure a tablespoon. They would just go take a, a fucking spoon out of their drawer right. and just pour into it. That's why they don't, if you look at dosing now, they don't use teaspoons and tablespoons. They'll put it into milliliters just because you're not going to go to your drawer and be like, oh, this looks like it's about 10 milliliters. And they give you that plastic cap that measures it out. Yeah. So there's a handful of stuff like this that's been around for a long time that probably should be reviewed and and looked at and, and likely pulled off the market too. There are plenty of better alternatives these days. So the path on that to me is interesting, but this one was fascinating to me because as you well pointed out, um, in the middle of this segment, and they got a little bit of fraud going on in here, right? When you've got no kidding seven studies and one just is like, oh, it's great. This data is fantastic. Look at this. And then they look at the data. They, they should go, be disqualified to do lab work. I mean, there should be a well, big penalty for fraudulent data. Totally. They should also be disqualified from doing bad false lab work. You can't even do that right. Like you can't even make up data <laughs> right. well. You can't even randomize your last Like digit. for fuck's sake, come on. <laughs> like, <laughs> there are literally Python libraries that do this shit for sure. you. You just got like a guy in Excel. It was like an intern in Excel, just hammering in numbers, right, right. copy and paste. There was it was one of these uh, one of these startups that raised a bunch of money from like or no, they sold the business to J.P. Morgan. That's how they they caught them. I think I may have talked about it on the show. There was some like analyst at J.P. Morgan after the transaction was done that was looking at user accounts, and they noticed they noticed that the exact number of rows in the Excel sheet lined yes. up with the the maximum number of rows in Excel. And then like, well, that's one hell of a coincidence. Like you hit the lotto to have the exact same number, and you're like, oh, somebody's just making up data and. In Excel, some like uh, college app application thing or something. I don't remember. <laughs> I thought this was fascinating. To me, there's a couple of big takeaways. One, don't if you're sick, don't buy Sudafed uh, PE. Shit PE, doesn't work. Right. right. Go buy the get the stuff behind the counter. Go the talk math. to the pharmacist. Get, get the, the math real behind stuff. the counter. And then also, you know, if you're bored, bitch to your congressman about uh, maybe we should to, should take a give the FDA a little more money to take a look at some of these non prescription drugs that have been around forever that might be either not working and or killing people. All right, we have to get out of here, but quickly before we do, thank you for the segment. That was great. Have you seen or read anything good this last week? Oh, totally. Uh, did you happen to? catch the live stream of the uh, News Nation event on AI? I did not. No. You didn't? I Do you know about this? I don't catch as... I know it seems like I would. I don't catch as much News Nation as you would think I would. Oh my God, this is great. So this is, I'm of course, referring to the sketch on uh, Saturday Night Live from over the weekend with Keenan Thompson, who I just, I love. Uh -huh. He's supposed to be like a professor at like MIT on AI, and he's being interviewed, but he can't get through the interview because behind him are guys that look like Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> it's a great bit, or it's, you know, it's a great, it's a great <laughs> skit. However, the fact that the cast, the entire cast is losing 
losing their shit the entire time and out of character just makes the whole thing like they used to do on uh, the carol burnett show yeah absolutely where they just can't stop laughing they just can't stop laughing it's just break character it's fantastic so uh, i'll put a link in the show notes that's fun uh it's great you should totally watch it later how about you what have you seen if you haven't watched british youtuber arun maney's video the internet is starting to break here's why on why big tech companies suck right now you need to see it amazon netflix uber spotify facebook snapchat instagram tiktok youtube this is truly a must-see video illustrating something cory doctrow has been observing for a while now i'll put the link in the show notes the internet is starting to break here's why i, I love cory doctrow this segment feels like something i'm gonna be angry about am i gonna be angry about this or am i gonna like this how's this gonna go it's like a consumer warning yeah. so many of these services sure. you start out as great services no, I and get then it. you're just massively getting ripped off i just thought clearly incorrectly i just always thought that we wanted people to listen to the show not listen to the show and then at the end go you know what these guys <laughs> are kind of they kind of i'm a downer they're big downers they're big, big naysayers big Debbie downers yeah. every time i'm just like oh the internet's Terrible. You don't want to get ripped off. This is a good uh, video about how these services tend to begin over time ripping you off. All right. Well, I'm not happy about it, but I'm going to check it out. That is the episode. Thank you for joining us for all this nonsense. A truly terrible podcast from The Awful Company. Visit us on the web at nonsense.productions. I'm Steve Little. I'm Jeff Parker. If you like this program, please follow, download, subscribe, and like it at Apple Podcasts, YouTube Music, Amazon Music, Antenna Pod, iHeartRadio, Spotify, My Favorite Overcast, or wherever you may get your podcast from. Nonsense uses Signal Messenger. There's no such thing as secure messaging on software that is not open sourced. Signal, strongly encrypted open source messaging. Check it out. Special thanks to our floor director, Tony Von Pervier. Oh, TVP, you're the best. Are we doing ads for Signal now? I had no idea. <laughs> I always plug. Pocketsindex.org. Are they not paying their bills? Is that the problem? They're not, no, they're they... Not, is that what <laughs> we happens? use so many other open source we'll show them. projects that are worthy yeah. of mentioning and promoting. Yeah, absolutely. So I thought, why not start yeah. plugging some of the other ones too? Okay. We're not taking any money for these things. Well, either way, I love seeing TVP in the control room. And uh, we'll be here every Thursday morning for more nonsense. Please join us. Cool. I got a flag. Can you hit stop? Ooh, I'm going to hit record first. Uh-oh.